Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevan Davani. You might have heard many years or even a couple of decades ago about uh, the so-called uh, terminology global warming, the CO2 crisis. And at that time, when I watched uh, these uh, talks with Mr. Um, ex um, ex uh, Vice President Al Gore, these talks about polar, polar bears and penguins, <laughs> and mm. all these um, yeah yeah cr the the uh, you know sort of global uh, warming crisis. I, at that time, I had no clue what it was talking about. I, I thought I, I thought it was talking about carbon monoxide. Uh, so, and as I learned, you know, that's, uh, we don't learn much in school, but at least I learned that, you know, the, the oxygen is usually in a double bonding uh, or any kind of element is usually in a double bonding. So I have a very, very special guest with me today who, uh, with a highly qualified expert in this field with a PhD in climatology. Um, and I'm just going to let you introduce yourself let, and, uh, you know, tell our viewers and um, listeners a little bit about your background and how you came about uh, to this topic, to, to your expertise, to your field expertise. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Tim Ball. Thank you, Kayvan, and thanks for the opportunity. I'm glad you mentioned Al Gore, by the way. Notice that nobody ever asks him his qualifications, <laughs> and that, that's the amazing side of it. Every time I'm on any program, I'm asked, and, I, and that's fair. I'm, I'm quite happy to say why I'm qualified. Somehow, because you're vice president, it makes you a, a know-all. Um, and uh, but that's the way the world is. Uh, people get credibility uh, simply because they publish a book. They get credibility. But uh, my my name is Tim Ball. I was born in England, um, and I uh, emigrated to Canada, and uh, went to uh, went back to university. Actually, I joined the Canadian Air Force. Was the first thing I did because I love flying. <laughs> and I wanted the, the taxpayers to pay for me to see the world. <laughs> so this is the way to do it. And, and um, four, the first four years were anti-submarine patrols over the North Atlantic. This is during the Cold War. So I was involved in the whole Cuban crisis and so on. And, of course, one of the things I saw with all of that was uh, the misinformation that the world got on what was actually going on there. And, and then... Uh, I was transferred to search and rescue in Arctic Canada, which was an incredible experience. Um, I mean, when you, 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 most Canadians have no idea that their country is as big this way as it is this way. And, and um, you, you go to Baffin Island, it makes Norway look like a flatland. It's just absolutely unbelievable. But out of both of those experiences, um, I realized how bad weather forecasting was. It, I mean, it, it, uh, there was a couple of days when it was really, truly dangerous. We were out on searches, and we were told there was going to be clear sky. So we get up into our search area, and there's freezing rain. And, of course, that, um, in terms of icing on your plane, that's the last thing that you need at low altitude. And so after I lost my flying category, um, I, I'm, I'm like you. I want to know. I want answers. Um, and um, so I decided to uh, take the little bit of money that they gave me uh, as severance from the military and go back to university and try to figure out why weather court forecasting was so bad. Why did we, after all these years, did we know so little? And, of course, what I found out was that um, two other people had started on the same venture. One was uh, a Reed Bryson at Wisconsin University, and he'd been working in the American Weather Service and came up against the same problem. And then a fellow by the name of Hubert Lamb, who was in, in England, and he's the guy that founded the Climatic Research Unit. And he found it because um, he'd, get, he'd been doing forecasting for pilots flying over Germany in the Second World War. And they'd come back and scream and yell at him and saying, you know, this is, this is terrible. So he, he, just, he determined that the only way you can improve forecasting, and this is true about any aspect of science, science is about prediction. If you can't predict, you don't have science. And that's the question people have to ask themselves. If the science of global warming is settled, how come they still can't forecast the weather for five days from now? But they're quite happy to tell you, oh, you know what, it's going to be like 50 years from now. But this is absolute rubbish. This, this is pure evidence of it being political. And uh, so 
what what uh, Lamb found was when he started looking at the historic record, just how much the climate had varied in very short periods of time. And that's an important uh, idea. Um, people think that uh, everybody sees the world the way they do. They don't. I mean, one of the things I learned working with the Chinese or, or the Russians or other groups, uh, they have a completely different view of the world. And yet you talk to them, and this is what amuses me in, in the world of politics and so on, where the Americans and the Chinese are, think they're talking to each other, but they're not. They're talking right past each other because they're, they're seeing the world uh, very differently. And, and so uh, I, I began to look at what they were doing and what, what, what uh, Lam was doing. Lam was reconstructing long-term weather records. And so that's what I figured I had to do. I had to find uh, a record of at least 300 years in length that uh, was a daily journal of weather what, that had been recorded relatively consistently. And also uh, when they brought instruments in that I could have instrument uh, measurements to confirm the written record. And I found this in the Hudson Bay Company journals. This is one of the world's great companies. The Hudson Bay Company is unquestionably the largest multinational corporation that's ever existed. And nobody has ever talked about it like that. Um, it, at, its, at the peak of its power, it controlled one-twelfth of the world's land surface. A private company controlling one twelfth the world's land surface. They had their own currency. They had the, they literally had the the right of uh, life and death over their employees. But of course, in order to uh, function with gathering furs and and working off of nature, uh, they had to know what the weather and the climate was doing. And the other thing is, if you're going to keep a journal. The standard thing you're going to record every day that occurs every day is the weather. So they directed their uh, employees to keep daily weather journals that recorded the wind and the sun and the precipitation and so on. Well, what I did was I computer coded that. Uh, so, for example, with wind, the north wind was one and on and on. I ended up with six million digits of information, which I could then, of course, run st analysis on and, and look at how climate was changing. And that brought it home to me the degree to which climate changes. Now, the question is, why didn't people understand that? I mean, climate sh climate's only become an issue in the last, well, since 1970. Prior to that, nobody cared what the climate did. The Greeks knew about climate. The Greeks knew, in fact, the word climate is the Greek word for angle. And what they were talking about was the angle of the sun at which the sun strikes the surface of the earth, which of course determines, and they created three climate zones, the, 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 the warm zone or torrid zone, the temperate zone, and the frigid zone. So the Greeks had a, a climate uh, pattern of the earth. All of that disappears in, in the, during the Middle Ages, and it doesn't come back in until the 18th, late 18th century that we start to look at the atmosphere again. And that's, of course, when we started measuring uh, oxygen and CO2 in the atmosphere. So when I talk about people seeing the world very differently, what I'm talking about is that in the Western world, our view is what is called a uniformitarian view of the world. That is that change is very gradual over long periods of time. That's how all the people in the West have been educated to look at the world. That's how Western science is based upon that. It's simply not true. Darwin adopted it because it, it suited his purpose. He needed a long period of time for evolution to occur. But if, if, and he knew that the changes occurred very rapidly because he'd looked at finches changing within two or three generations in the Galapagos. So, but he knew if he said that, the church would go ballistic and he didn't want to uh, run into, into uh, uh, fights with the, with the church. So he said, no, okay, it's uniformitarianism and, and um, that, that was how we ended up with that view of the world. Um, that's why today, when people come along and say, oh, change is occurring, oh, change, that's not normal, it must be something humans are doing, that's how we've got ourselves into this mess. 
So when people like me come along and say, no, the change is perfectly normal. What, what are you talking about? Oh, well, you're one of those uh, crazy conspiracy theorists. No, look at the long-term history of the world. I mean, if you think about just 20,000 years ago, which in human history is, is just yesterday, North America, two-thirds of it was covered with an, an ice sheet larger than the current Antarctic ice sheet. Well, what put that there? And what caused it to melt in about 5,000 years? Certainly wasn't humans driving cars. So when you start to look at the long-term pattern, you suddenly realize that change and dramatic change is the normal, but that's not how uh, the people have been educated to look at the world. And so this is the conflict that's going on. And, and so when, when I, I, people come along and say, well, well, of course, climate changes, yeah, but you know how much the climate changes and how rapidly the climate changes? And we're not talking about climate change, we're talking about human-caused climate change. That's what people don't understand. They, they just throw out the, the phrase climate change. But the real issue is, are humans causing climate change? So when we start to sort all of that out, we start to see why there's so much uh, confusion about what's actually happening. And of course, when I started studying the climate, um, and I got out of the military, and this is back in, in the late 60s, and I went back to university, and the, the consensus at that time, and that word, by the way, doesn't apply to science. Cons science isn't about consensus. The minute you hear them talking about, oh, 97% consensus, that's rubbish. Because as Einstein said, I can have 100 theories prove me right. I've only got to have one prove me wrong, and it's all over. Right? So consensus does not apply. So the minute you hear the word consensus used with climate, you know it's a political ag agenda. But um, the... Uh, so when I started out, the world had been cooling down from 1940 to 1980. So I come in in the middle of that, 1970, and, and everybody's saying, oh, it's cooling. The CIA produced two reports on the impact of the cooling on world food production, social unrest, political unrest, and what the American government had to have troops ready to go in and deal with all of this. That, that just... Uh, what 50 years ago and here we are now oh it's warming it's going to warm forever well i was as opposed to the uh, simplistic linear trend projections oh it's cooling so it's going to keep on cooling so no look at the history it goes up and down all the time and i predict that uh, then i said it's going to start warming uh, within a few years well by 1980 it turned around and the world started to warm up. And then everybody jumped on the warming trend wagon and, oh, it's going to warm forever. And I said, no, 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 no. Oh, yes, uh, your conspiracy. They're paid by the oil companies not to be trusted. Uh, but what, if people would just simply stop, take the hysteria out of it, stop being exploited by people that want to control you, because that's what this is all about, and and uh, realize how much the climate changes, and and uh, of course the other factor that we now uh, need to be looking at is what causes these climate changes. And most people uh, can't tell you. Most people will say, "Oh, it's CO two," but CO two is saying that CO two is causing climate change. It's like saying a wart on your left arm is controlling your whole, whole life. That's how stupid it is. It's like saying one bolt on the rear wheel of a car is controlling and dictating the whole car. The engine is the sun. They don't even look at the sun. The transmission is the oceans. They know, know virtually nothing about the oceans. The, rear, the wheels and the drive are, are the uh, atmosphere. We know virtually nothing about the atmosphere. We don't even know how much water vapor is in the atmosphere at any given time. So uh, what you've got is people, uh, and, and by the way, one of the things that drives it, of course, uh, two, well, two things that drive it. One is money, the research funding. I watched this in my career in university. When I started out, it, you got promoted and advanced on the basis of your publications, your research. Mm -hmm. 
and 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 of course then what happened was people produced papers simply to count get a big count number the quality was rubbish they were producing rubbish but oh i got 28 papers yeah, but does anybody ever look at any of them no it doesn't matter isn't that, I, doc, isn't that dr ball i mean the whole review peer so-called peer, peer review process it's, it's, it, i mean it's yeah. so hard i know in the natural science it's so hard to get an article into a natural science uh, peer review journal because yeah. the, so nine five percent is rejected at the first yep. instance, right? Yep, yep. But but that was what was what what was wrong at the, the climatic research unit when those emails were leaked because they were not only authoring papers together but they were peer reviewing their own papers. I mean, it was a completely incestuous system. But but anyway, um, the uh, the the peer review process is is really meaningless, and and uh, so. When when you start to look at the actual data and what what's what's really going on, um, you see a very very different picture. But but that right now, the um, hysteria. It, it's like it's like if you're going to take over leadership, the the world's in a moral panic right now. It's about you know about global warming and about other things. The real smart leaders are not stepping forward because they know. The panic is such that they can't bring any semblance of order to it. The only way you can do it right now is to step in authoritarian dictatorship. You know, and some people argue that's what Trump is doing, that, that he stepped in and said, no, stop, just stop. And, and, uh, and in a way, that, that is true, and that is what he is doing. But the, the question is, will he continue to be a dictator or will he become a benevolent dictator? And that's the issue. But the really... We lost you. No, no, I'm here. Okay, I just, okay. A little so bit of screen sharing of your website. Oh, okay. And and so so what you uh, what you're looking at um, is is um, the the ball dot ca the website right, Doctor Team Ball. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that, ball dot ca. Yeah. And I want to recommend everyone to watch this um, beautiful presentation of Doctor Tim Ball, the deliberate corruption of climate science. Uh, that was in 2014, right? Yeah. Yes. All the details and the the book is definitely a must read of deliberate corruption of climate science. Yeah. There's there's two uh, there's two books that you have, that one uh, and, and one, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Now let, let let me explain, Kevin. This is a part of the this is part of the issue we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The the uh, deliberate corruption book here, mm -hmm. that one there, um, that was the first book I wrote. And it's very detailed. It's got citations, footnotes, and everything else. And the reason I had to do that was because I knew the academics would attack me. Yeah. And if you if you don't have everything tied down, they'll find one flaw and throw the whole thing out because they don't like the idea or it doesn't agree with them. So I wrote that book, and as I said, it, it was very detailed, footnoting and everything else. Uh, as one lawyer said to me, he said, it, it was a great book, but it was a real slog. And that and that's that true. I I appreciate that. I said that to him. I said I knew that was the difficulty. I mean, you can see all the footnotes through it. But then what I did was uh, a couple of years later, I produced the other book, the Human Cause Global Warming, and and uh, that's the deliberate corruption. Okay, the Human Cause Global Warming. It runs to about 106 pages. It's got no footnoting in it. It's it's just simply it it's a very simple um, uh, approach. Uh, in terms of um, here we see in investigative journalism, yeah. the why, what, where, when, and and of course, investigative journalism doesn't occur in today's world anymore. No, no, no. it's already ex uh, extinct. To be honest it, with you, yeah, yeah exactly. So, so that that book I wanted as as uh, something that anybody could pick up, put in their pocket, and read in in an, a couple of hours, and and just understand the whole dynamics of what was going on. And then what I do at the end of that book is say, look, if you want all the detail, go and read my other book. And 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 so and there's a lot of diagrams in that book because of course uh, pictures are worth a thousand words, and um, in the in this case they're worth a million words. Yeah. So so that was how that came came about. Um, but but the whole uh, the whole idea uh, of of uh, the global warming. Uh, came about because and it actually the whole thing didn't start with climate mm -hmm. the whole thing started with the club of rome 
this group of of uh, elitist uh, power controlling people uh, led by David Rockefeller the club of rome was created in in 1968 and they decided that the world was overpopulated and of course this is what elites always do they they want fewer people and only of their own kind right it's like how people always saying well we're overpopulated i said okay which ones are you going to get rid of who's going to decide so ridiculous yeah yeah it's ridiculous yeah go ahead i was just going to say your video has been off for about 10 minutes i don't know why oh. but uh um maybe oh yeah is that connection problem with your video i mean we can hear you clear i can hear you clearly just keep trying no no it's not going to work No. Uh, okay. Well, uh, where, where were we? We were we were uh, talking about. Um, uh, oh yes, I know the Club of Rome. Exactly. Right. And now there was there was a, a, a after the war, there were all of these people that were saying the world's overpopulated. There's too many people in the world. It's using resources at too fast a rate, and all of these uh, doom and gloom that the world can't support. And that culminated in the Club of Rome's book, Limits to Growth. So what they were saying was, look, there are limits to growth. Well, obviously there are in a finite world, but we're not anywhere close to any of those. And one of the things that um, uh, H.L. Mencken said about uh, almost 100 years ago now, he said, the urge to save the planet is almost always a false front for the urge to rule. So in other words, what you do is you say the sky is falling, the world's coming to an end, and you better put me in uh, give me the power to save you from the end and that's what the club of rome did and and uh, so they uh people like paul ehrlich produced a book called population bomb and and when you read that and it was 1977 i think would you go and read that all of his forecasts were 100 percent wrong i mean it, it he said that britain wouldn't exist by the year 2000 this is the kind of nonsense that these people were producing and uh, so the Club of Rome said there were too many people and they were using resources at, at too great a rate. The world simply could not sustain it. And it was a combination of everybody on the planet using resources, but then the people in industrialized nations mm -hmm. using fossil fuels uh, were uh, using the resources at an even greater rate than everybody else. And so that that was uh, what the uh, the Club of Rome uh, brought forward was that yeah there's the population bomb you see with with uh, Paul Ehrlich so so what they what they said was that we've got to um, uh, we've got to find a way to to uh, cut back or reduce the industrialized nations mm -hmm. what one of the members of the Club of Rome was Morris Strong uh, and Strong. Uh, who was a, a socialist out of Canada, and he moved to the U.S., made a lot of money as a uh, uh, as a oil man, and then uh, went uh, went to the U.N. to implement his ideas. And uh, when he was interviewed by Elaine Dewar in a book called Cloak of Green, uh, she said to him, well, what's the problem for the planet? And he said, uh, the problem for the planet are the industrialized nations, and isn't it our responsibility to get rid of them? And amazing. The, qu the question you have, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's just, it's just incredible. I mean, if you just look at the facts and the data, yeah, that's what what people are, I think are so overburdened because they're so bombarded with so much disinformation, with so much garbage, with yeah. so much artificially fabricated manipulated science that you know I I, I I mean I can hardly blame the people because they don't have the time to research even though we have the World Wide Web but when they're bombarded you know uh, on in the university starting university in school in a mainstream media by the politicians uh, and all these you know um, everybody who's on the bandwagon uh, just doing it for the profit motive and then yeah. the other uh, sort of intention of whatever agenda is behind it you know yeah um but go ahead sorry no 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 it, 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 and and this is this is one of the great um i say illusions and michael Crichton talked about this i i mentioned it before he 
put it in his book, but it's, if they call it the age of information, I call it the age of misinformation. Mm -hmm. I, I also call it the age of speculation. Uh, because uh, everything that you hear is speculation. And one of the things that, by the way, that, that people need to understand is there is virtually no hard data, empirical data or real data. I mean, they talk about, oh, there, there's this much CO2 in the atmosphere. We, we, we've only got six measuring points around the world, and the CO2 varies tremendously from hour to hour. And, and so when they, when they say they know how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, it's simply false. And then if you say, well, how, how much does it change over time? Oh, well, it's increasing. Well, how do you know? The answer is they don't. They want it to be increasing because that's part of their political agenda. So the numbers that they create are not real numbers. I'll tell you how bad this has become, Kayvon, mm -hmm. it is in the computer models, because they don't have any data for most of the model, they will create a, a small computer model. Let's say, well, well what, what are the, what's happening to the uh, gases moving in and out of the ocean? Well, we don't have any measurements of that. Well, okay, well, let's create a computer model of that, the atmosphere-ocean interface. And they will then, that model will then create data. They'll then use that data as real data in another computer model. Okay, so it's it's like it's like uh, making a, a a model car, and the car, the model car is made up of pieces of model. So so the wheels are models. This is how ridiculous it's become, and and but but you see the data that's out there. Everybody, oh, there's so much information, so much data. The other problem is that. We have gone some very dramatic changes to help you understand this. Um, we have not taught our students how to analyze, how to be critical. Critical thinking has gone out the window. And one of the ways that I saw that at the university was it used to be when I, in fact, even when I started at university, that the old professors had the prevailing wisdoms and they got up and said, oh, this is the way the world works and all the students learned from that. But the young students challenged that. Exactly. They, they at least questioned. I mean, at least quite, exactly, yeah. You know, we, 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 we didn't learn that. It's, I mean, people nowadays, they don't even learn to question or to, right. you know, not to criticize, but just to, you know, yeah. uh, is it, is, is there, like creatively, like is it, is it based on what is it based, uh, what we hear? Is but but that, flat? I mean, <laughs> you yeah. Know. But that but that's how that's you, how you get a compliant society. I mean, it, it, Ignatius Loyola, who just who founded the Jesuits, and of course the current Pope is a Jesuit, the only Jesuit ever to become Pope, by the way. And and Ignatius Loyola said, "Give me the child, and I'll give you the adult." Well, guess who repeated that? Four hundred years later, was Joseph Goebbels. Hitler's uh, propaganda minister said, and they created the Hitler Youth, and they created the German person. And of course, Mao Zedong, his whole uh, Red Book campaign was all about creating a citizen who totally subjugated themselves to the state, that they thought of the state before they thought of themselves. And of course, as Eric Heilbronner, the American futurist, uh, said, you know, you can go on, you can only go on so many parades and jamborees, and after a while, you start to say, hey, I'm tired, I'm dirty, I'm hungry, to hell with the parade, I'm going home. And of course, that's what causes revolutions. But all of these world leaders, I don't care who it is, it's all about total control of the people. And that's what, exactly what's going on with this climate issue right now that, that uh, we'll control, if we can say, look, there's a threat to the world. And the, when you read the Club of Rome's book, uh, you know, the, 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 next, or the next global revolution, they said, here's the things we thought about. Pollution, water resources, global warming. Whoa, there's the perfect one. Global warming, the world's going to warm up because these these industries are producing CO2. And that goes back to my earlier point. If you say, I want to shut down the industrialized nations, how would you go about doing it? This is what people need to understand is, is that uh, evil people are very clever. 
Exactly. And this is what they call Hegelian, you know, yeah. according to the philosopher, Hegelian uh, dialectic. You yeah. first create the problem, you just create yeah. it artificially, and then you deliver the solution, and then everybody applauds, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, and that's exactly what's going on now. And they're all jumping on the wagon. And of course, it, it you you can do it, it, it very quickly, and and then it doesn't take much uh, for you to become ice. Anybody that dares to question becomes isolated, mm -hmm. even if you're qualified. I mean, the initial argument: Oh, you're not qualified. Exactly. Then then I come along and say, "Well, look, hang on a minute. I am qualified." And I can explain to these people what's actually go. Oh, we better bring lawsuits against that guy. We better shut him up. Yeah, that's that's what happens. Can I ask you something? Because, uh, yeah. you know, the reason I emphasize the beginning that you have a PhD in historical climatology is yeah. because there's been a petition going on. It's, it's a couple of years old now by, I don't know, 30, 31,000 doctors, scientists, um, not necessarily climatology experts in per se, but uh, do you know anything? What can you tell us? I mean, because this is what people then, you know, say, oh, these are people you know, they, they don't have the credentials, they don't have the experience, right. they don't have, you know, they, right. they just paid uh, uh, whatever mules. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, what, what you're talking about is the Oregon petition. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're at, at about, uh, oh, 20 years ago or more, uh, there were three of these groups that formed. There was the Heidelberg group, the Oregon petition, and I've forgotten what the third one was. Uh, Fred Singer, who of course is one of the people who've been in the uh, skeptics game for a long time, he's the one that got the Oregon project going. And um, you know, what they did was they got, I think, 12 or 13 Nobel Prize winners and all of these other scientists all to say, no, the global warming uh, uh, science is rubbish. I didn't sign that. Fred is still mad at me. And the reason I didn't sign it is because of what I talked about earlier. A consensus is nothing to do with science. Mm -hmm. Just because 31 scientists sign a, a, a claim that something's happening doesn't mean it's happening. And, and so you have to go and look at what are they actually saying. With the difficulty there right away, and I, I know all about this because I taught a science credit for art students. Mm -hmm. Right at, at the liberal arts university I was at, the program required that all students, both arts and science students, take a science credit course. Mm -hmm. Now, if a student was in physics, well, their physics course would count. But the ones that were in history, uh, they, they sort of got around the issue, but they created a history of science course. Well, it wasn't a science course. It was about the history of science. That has nothing to do with science. What you need to do is get students into a lab and collect data and, and, and deal with data and quantify data and analyze data. That's the scientific method, uh, you know, based around, around a hypothesis. Well, I taught a science credit for art students, and I made it a science course. And uh, I knew that if I walked into the first class, and I usually had three or 400 students every year, I could walk into the first class and put a formula on the board, and, and by, by the next class, half of them wouldn't come back. Because just the formula scares the hell out of them. So what I, what I started doing was putting a formula on the board, and then saying, okay, well, this letter, or you know, number, whatever, stands for, and then I'd write out what that symbol stood for. And then, at the, so across the bottom, you end up with a sentence, which they can read and understand. I said, but that's all a formula is. A formula is a sentence, but it's done in symbols because of, of space and time and, and, and so on, and, and agreement. And, and so, uh, this was how I start, started teaching the course. And I also, by the way, and this, this is so much a problem in today's world. My, my other opening comment was, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's not yesterday's truth, and it won't be tomorrow's truth. It's just the truth as we know it right now. And I said, here's the critical thing you, you as students must understand. That's what you think. That's what you uh, accept. But I said, if some new information comes along and you just say, no, I don't want that new information. I don't want to hear it. Then you are opinionated. 
you must keep an open mind. You and and I I tell I tell everybody, I've got a view of climate change and global warming. But if somebody can show me I'm wrong, I've got to be the first person out there saying I was wrong. Because if I'm not, then I'm not being true to science. And, and uh, so th this, these are things that, of course, have completely uh, disappeared in this modern uh, in indoctrination system, because it certainly isn't an education system. Yep. And, and you, you see that, as I said, with the young, the young students coming in totally indoctrinated, and they're the ones that uh, dictate to the old professors uh, what, what the way the world works. Mm -hmm. And so they've turned the whole system upside down. And, and of course, uh, th then the exploitation of the internet and the media. Uh, so, so that we're getting to the truth is ten times more difficult than it ever was in in the history of mankind. Yeah, because you have to filter and so right. I mean, you really have to do due diligence and research, investigative research that takes right. time and energy. And most people just don't have the time, resources, the energy. It, they, they're working eight to twelve hours a day. They have yeah. They have debts. They have the central banking problem that's creating the problems for them. So, uh, what I was gonna you know say because. You, you know, we talk about the human civilization and this whole religious indoctrination is based, you know, on creating uh, emotions and, and feelings of guilt. Now, yeah. now comes on, top, on top of that, you have this so-called environmental religion where, you know, this whole uh, indoctrination dogma is trying to sort of put another layer of guilt on people that what are you living for? And I mean, you know, you, you're guilty yeah. of living, of existing, of... Of, of trying to prosper and, and flourish in this civilization. So yeah. I'm not sure, you know, what is, what can we like differentiate between these agendas? One yes. of them, okay, I understand that it's for the money, it's for greed, yeah. it's for wealth, it's for PhDs trying to keep their jobs or whatever because in yeah. their in the dependencies. But then you've got, you know, all the bigger, the, you know, much centralized structures on top of that. What are they trying to achieve? Is that seriously about yeah. uh, po population reduction? Well, the, yeah, I'll, I'll come back around to that. But sure. I, first, I want to tell you about my hero, and and uh, I'll just I'll just say that uh, his, his his initials are MB. Uh, this is the only one of the few people I ever met who did what everybody should be doing. Every when I was in the Air Force, every winter we had a, a one crew got to go down to Puerto Rico, and it was called train winter training, which of course is a laugh. Winter training should be done in the winter, but in Canada it it involved going to Puerto Rico. Um, he took his crew down there. It was two weeks, and all it was was a big dr cheap drunk, and he brought all ba all sorts of cheap cheap booze back in the airplane. They brought so much booze back in the airplane that when we landed, that they land and tax over over to the side of the runway, dump all the booze off, and then go and visit the customs inspection officer. Okay, now this guy came back, MB came back, and he submitted his report. Now, all the other people came back and said, oh, it was a wonderful exercise. We learned so much. MB came back and said, it's a total waste of the taxpayer's money. It's nothing but a booze run, and it should be stopped immediately. That was the truth. That's what should have been happening. But very, very few people will do that. And that's the difficulty. People are so easily bought, and then they're so intimidated by the the suppression if you dare to stick your head up you get attacked and 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 so being uh, of the pure uh, respect and all the rest of it that's that's what's happening in the world now let's set all that aside society changes by adopting a new paradigms and the academics call it a paradigm shift so in other words we looked at the world on this particular issue this way and now we're saying, hey, that, that's not working. We need to rethink how we're seeing the world. And uh, that is called a paradigm shift. The two major paradigm shifts in the 20th century, the first one was uh, environmentalism. The second one was feminism. Now, what happens with an environmental sh uh, or a, a paradigm shift? The majority of people see that, hey, yeah, this is a, this is an interesting and maybe a better way of looking at things. 
But the nature of humans is that we are small c conservative. We're afraid of change. And that is perfectly legitimate because whenever change occurs, somebody wins and somebody loses, and you don't know who the winners and losers are going to be. So you tend to say, well, I'll wait and see. You know, I won't rush into this. That's, that's the majority, probably 70% in the middle. Then there's an, about 20% who say, I don't care what the new idea is. I'm, I'm not going to change. I'm, I'm sticking with the old way. That's, that's it. And then there's 20%, or actually probably a 15%, who say, hey, this is, a, this is a great idea for me to get power and to make money. They grab it, and they take off with it. And meanwhile, that middle group, the, the majority, are sitting there saying, well, yeah, there's some good stuff, some good ideas, but... Not so sure. That's what happened with both environmentalism and with feminism. Now, I used to wonder, because I've been fighting these issues for a long time, what brings people to the point where they either reject or accept the new paradigm? And uh, I discovered that it is the extremists that define the limits for the rest of us. Because we're sitting there and say, let, let's say with the women, women are saying, well, hey, this, this, there's still some things need to be changed, but uh, I don't know, maybe we're losing more than we're gaining now. Then the extremists do something completely crazy. Oh, well, let's all burn our bra bras. And the, the women are saying, no, no, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Yeah, I, I don't particularly like it, but you know, there's some realities to life here. And so by doing that, they, the extremists have defined a limit. That's where we are now with the environmental issue. That, that, and, and the people that have introduced the new paradigm and, and promoted it and benefited from it, they've got a choice. They can either say, yeah, it, it, um, it, it isn't exactly as I said it would be, or, or you know, there, there's problems with this, or they double down. Most of the time, because they're benefiting it from it in terms of power and money, they double down. But, but eventually, because they're doubling down, they get overridden. And so this is how society changes its ideas and moves. And, and, and of course, it doesn't matter how long we'll go on with environmentalism, there'll still be a small percentage that will say, no, I don't buy that. And, but that's the nature of humanity. And, and it, it's this distribution and how that whole thing moves en masse that, that we need to understand. And as I said, the, the two big paradigm shifts in the 20th century was environmentalism and uh, feminism. My concern, and this, there has been instances of this in history, is that um, they so overstate the case. They so... Uh, impinge upon people's lives that people start to say I don't believe anything you tell me anymore mm -hmm. we're dangerously close to that with the environmental issues yeah right? it lost credibility I mean it, exactly and and so so they'll people will then the, the phrase is that they'll throw the baby out with the bathwater mm -hmm. when when there are issues that we need to deal with I mean I, I happen to think water is an issue we need to deal with yes soil, soil erosion is an issue we need to deal with there I mean, are there's just so many environmental problems. We have millions, I don't know how much, you know, uh, millions of tons of plastic in the yeah. oceans within the bodies of whales and dolphins and animals. I mean, this is this is a real okay. problem. Okay, but Kevin, here's here's see that that's a perfect example for me to pick up on. And I understand, you know, when you see the image of the, the, the whale being opened up and there's the plastic in its stomach. Yeah, that should never, ever happen. But what brought about that plastic issue? Well, first of all, America produces only 11% of the world's plastic. Mm -hmm. That all recycled plastic was being collected up because there was money in it for people, right? And it was being shipped by the boatload to Southeast Asia. Right. A lot of people don't know that European uh, newsprint, they can only recycle about 60% of it. So 40% of it, they have to go send it somewhere, get rid of it. They're sending it to African countries who are simply burying it in their countries because they want to get paid for that. That's, that's the, the great illusion of, of, oh, yeah, we're solving the problem. Out of sight, out of mind. 
Okay, so what happened was this plastic was being shipped to Indonesia, Malaysia, and these other countries, and then they suddenly decided, because of the cost of energy and other things going up, they said, no, we don't want your plastic anymore. And so here are all these ships out on the ocean full of plastic. Where do they go? They dumped it in the ocean. That's what created that huge... Uh, and then they get a nine-year-old boy who knew nothing about what was going on, and he said, oh, the plastic issue it is. No, rubbish. And they look at the, they banned straws in San Francisco, but they don't ban uh, drug needles on the street in San Francisco. I mean, the priorities go out the window in every single one of these issues. Now, that's not to say that plastic isn't, hasn't got some problems. And if you don't deal with it properly, uh, you know, just using it and throwing away, we can't compete, we can't keep doing that. Uh, but that's what the whole environmental movement is, is about. But what we need to do is determine what are the actual facts? What are the realities of it? What are the, what are the energy investments in, in this? And, and uh, until we start doing that, until we calm down, and stop this hysteria. And, and, and by the way, what's going on right now um, is, is a well-known phenomenon in history, and, and, and it, it, it's called a moral panic. Hmm. You get, uh, well, moral panic is, is when you get um, a, a small group of people uh, decide that something is a threat to the society, mm -hmm. and they create uh, false information, and they bring facts forward and the panic sets in the classic example was the uh, witch hunts throughout history which witch hunts uh, occurred when there was a failure of the food supply and what happens when uh, th that occurs the food supply fails because it's usually cold and wet and the harvests fail but what you get then in the are in the crops that grow you get a, a fungus growing called ergot e-r-g-o-t even if you grind that up into a bread, that ergot fungus will poison the people that eat it. And the symptoms of er ergot fungus poisoning are the, exactly the same as witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's uh, people hearing voices, people dancing frenetically till they, till they die of exhaustion, all of the symptoms of witchcraft. And, and, and so what happens then, of course, is a moral panic sets in. Oh, it's these women exactly. who are behaving weirdly they're the ones that are causing your crop failure we better execute them we better drown them in the nearest pond so these moral panics uh, you can see them throughout history that's what we're in the middle of right now we're in the but, moral panic but doctor <coughs> don't we have like a you know <clears throat> more subtle form of inquisitional witch hunting right now it, it is what's just going on in different form you know i mean if you of course you violate if you sort of say anything against the official narrative yeah. the officially accepted narrative well then you're witch hunt whether you're a scientist or a you know average person you're being you know ridiculed attacked or yeah. even i don't know imprisoned yeah. or tortured or or, or, or threatened Yes, and, and of course, <clears throat> Rush Limbaugh said, <clears throat> if you want to solve any problem, follow the money. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't agree with him. Up to a point, yes. Yeah. There are, the, the majority will, will be easily bought off. But there's that small percentage that I talked about earlier. What they're in it for is the power. Yeah. They, they know if they get the power, the money will come. They don't even, they don't even start with the money. Well, right. are, are we talking then about the structures, I mean, in the centralized structures in this civilization where they already have, I mean, everything they, they you, I mean, what else do you need when you have all the wealth, all, you know, when you can print as much money as possible, uh, talking about the owners and stockholders of the privately owned central banks, and then you've got, you know, whatever uh, layers you've got below that, yeah. the corporate level, the institutional level, the military industrial level isn't that that's not about money anymore that's about control obsession it, it's all about power yes now what i want you to think about we talked earlier i mentioned the year 1859 and darwin's publishing of the origin of the species and so on well about eight years before darwin published uh, origin of the species 
Marx co uh, published the Communist Manif Manifesto. If you say to the public, oh, Marx is, is uh, 19th century. Oh, no, no, he's 20th century. No, Marx was 19th century. And he, so what you had in the middle of the 19th century, right around that year 1859, was the, the foundation, the philosophical foundation of capitalism, Darwin, survival of the fittest, right? And Darwin took that phrase, survival of the fittest, from Herbert Spencer, a sociologist, who, and, and Darwin said, hey, I like that phrase. I'm going to put that into the sixth edition of The Origin of the Species. So Darwin then effectively becomes the, the philosophical foundation of capitalism based upon how he viewed animals and humans' behavior and so on. Marx, of course, is saying, no, it's, it's all about taking from the successful and giving to the, to the ones that are not as successful great distribution. Up to this very point, all we've tried are those two very simplistic socioeconomic systems. There are countries that are trying different forms of it. In a way, China is a different form. China is state capitalism, mm -hmm. right? It, it's a, and, 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 uh, and, and Russia is trying somewhat the same thing. They're doing it from a different uh, approach. But what China's doing is saying, okay, we're going to keep communism as our political system, but we're going to have capitalism as our economic system. Well, the question is, can they, uh, co can they coexist? And the answer is probably not. That, that uh, it, you know, as the, as the Chinese are finding now, as their economy is going down, and it's down about, what, 40% or something, then suddenly the, the government are losing control. The people are, are, are forming unions, they're going on strike, and, and, and all of those things that once you give people that little bit of, of freedom, it's very hard to take it back. And so this is what the, what the uh, Chinese the communists are discovering. Uh, the, that you really cannot have the two systems coexist. But this is the stage that we're at in terms of human development. Because you see, you can talk about uh, human evolution in the Darwinian sense. Um, and, and notice, by the way, that an anthropologist can talk about a group of people being primitive. Mm -hmm. A historian wouldn't dare say that. <laughs> That's politically incorrect. And there you see that gap between ancient history and human evolution and the modern social society. And we, we can't get across that gap. We're trying to find out how do we get across that gap. And what we've got to start by doing is realizing that societies evolve just like bones and people evolve. That, that our social structures, our thinking evolves, mm -hmm. that we think differently than the people that went before us. And of course, that evolution of thought really is only about 200 years old. Yeah, but I, don't, you, don't you think, uh, Tim, that it needs also a degree of humbleness um, to look into the mirror, I'm talking about, you know, specifically yeah, yeah. also about the scientists that are, you know, yeah. in, in this world of, I don't know, of, of cognitive dissonance or manipulation yeah. of science, data, facts, I mean, reality. Uh, it needs a lot of humbleness to look into the mirror and say, you know what, with intentionally or negligently or whatever, I've been wrong. I mean, you know, after whatever, after years, decades, or hundreds of years of dogma or indoctrination or false, deliberate corruption of the science, it's false. It's wrong to do this, you know? Okay, but, but, but think about what you're saying and think about how that speaks to the problem that we're at. I, I mentioned Darwin, 1859, and I talk about this in the book. And that, in that year, Alexander von Humboldt died. Von Humboldt was a German uh, geographer and me, uh, physicist. And in fact, uh, people refer to him as the last universal person. And what they mean by that is that he knew everything there was to know on, in the world. He knew all the chemistry, all the physics, all the biology. And he died in 1859. Because of what Darwin did, 
where Darwin said, look, if you're going to evolve scientific theories and, and a scientific method, you've got to collect data. So from Darwin on, the world was out there counting, measuring, and we're still doing that. And we still have only found and identified and named 35% of all the plants and animals on the planet. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, we've got a theory, but and what, what do we do? We've got a theory and suddenly uh, uh, something comes along, we find something that doesn't fit our theory. Well, we just could put it in a separate category. We did that with the, the duckbill platypus. You know, we had mammals and we had reptiles and we had birds. And suddenly here's this creature that is half mammal and half reptile. Well, well we just put it in its own category. But no, hang on a minute. It's telling you that your system is wrong. Yeah. Okay. And and so this is where we're at right now. We're still trying to uh, to get a, a measure on everything that's in the world, and and uh, we don't we don't have the uh, knowledge, we don't have the data, we don't have the ability, but people still believe. Oh yeah, well we know everything. We know that everything there is to know in the world, and therefore we can reach conclusions. And and until we face up to the fact now one of those of course the other part of the darwin thing is that darwin was used by science the scientific community to get rid of god mm -hmm. right now i don't mean to get rid of god although darwin was an atheist um he he effectively said no god did not create the world Fine. And everybody says, yeah, e e it's evolution. Well, how do you create the world out of evolution? You can't do it. Right? Because in order to have evolution, you've got to start with something. Yeah. And the question yeah. then... I don't yeah. think we have a little bit too... Our whole educational and scientific structures are so compartmentalized, are so physically obsessed that, you know, people don't even question, okay, what comes after the particle? Uh, uh, whatever atoms, uh, nucleus, you know, subnucleus. There's got to be something. I mean, you know, forget God. I mean, what is God? It's the essence of creation. But when did that? What is that essence of creation? We talk. You also talked about in your presentation about the magnetic field. So is yeah. that for you? That what we what would interest me is that for you? You know, the essence of creation. Are we talking about field strength or fields? Like I, I, yeah. I think that one of the things, as you know, that Einstein, and, and by the way, I think that his wife worked on with him and published, was responsible yep. for a lot of his ideas. Exactly. Because after they split, he never produced anything else, but he went off into studying the unified field theory. Mm -hmm. The unified field theory speaks to what you're talking about. And, and of course, uh, it is the, the trilogy of gravity, electricity, and magnetism. Mm -hmm. I've, I've said all through the 20th century, uh, or my my part of it, um, that uh, the 21st century will focus upon two things, water and magnetism. Mm -hmm. Magnetism is the great force that, that we can predict it and measure it, but we don't know what it is. Exactly. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and of course, Einstein the unified field, field theory was that that he argued that there was some basic formula mm -hmm. um, that uh, that incorporated all three of those forces, how they interact and everything else. We're so far away from finding out those things. And then if you throw in, uh, you know, you you got the, the confusion. You see it in the military between conventional and nuclear war yeah. and you see it you see it in terms of electricity as one form of power and then nuclear power is a completely different form of power we haven't even come to terms with those things yet and of course um the difficulty that that darwin created when he got rid of god and so that then um uh, created the great problem in the university system of the social sciences well if god didn't put us here and make us different from the other animals who did well okay it's it's uh it's the whole um, evil uh, evolutionary thing uh, but that that uh, hasn't resolved anything 
uh, all the, I, I call social sciences human navel gazing. And, and it, it, it really, it, it, it's really a total waste of time. Um, and and it, so you've got that problem. And then you've got the problem that because Dar Darwin said, you've got to have sufficient data to support anything that you're going to argue, then the search for data and the proliferation of data to the point where no one person can encompass it anymore. That's why I talked about um, Von Humboldt being the last universal man. Well, today we talk about a Renaissance person. A Renaissance person is somebody who has a pretty good grasp of four or five disciplines. But that's about all any one mind can encompass nowadays. And, and so we've, we've, uh, our ideas have outgrown the capacity of our mind we then foolishly thought, oh, the computer has the capacity to handle many, many more variables. But the computer is simply, it, it's what we program it to be. It, 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 uh, it's gone from uh, garbage in, garbage out, to gospel in, gospel out. It tells us what we want to believe. And and so it's it's become a human again a human navel gazing like like um, like the social sciences. So this is the this is the point we're at. The way we're dealing with it in an education format is the the education system has become totally a, a an indoctrination and production of little work units for the industrial revolution. Right. So, so you you pick your own little specialized area, you go and study that, and we'll pay you a lot of money to to for, for that information that you have. The fact that you can't put your special area into the larger picture, the fact that you you know it, uh, the analogy that I use, uh, and and you see this in the generalization specialization argument that I'm sure you've read or heard me talk about, um, with the the nurse and the patients lying on the table. And the, the podi podiatrist who specializes in feet is looking at the feet. The nephrologist who specializes in kidneys is looking at the kidneys. And the neurosurgeon in the brain looking at the brain. And the nurse who looks at the whole patient is saying, but doctors, the patient's dead. Yeah. Right? That's the world we've got ourselves into now. Yeah. I mean, they're slowly evolving sort of an interdisciplinary holistic approach, even in medicine whatever healing, curing or whatever it is, technology, but it's really little, a little segment of that, of the total picture. But okay. you know, it's totally compartmentalized. It's so, it's so much based on assumptions and theories and hypotheses that we've been yeah. adopting for, I don't know, for how yeah. long? Well, well, certainly since the 30s, um, the, the, this is when the when the great change and, and pe people like Bertrand Russell and and um, uh, what's his name? I, I can never remember his name. Uh, the other mathematician philosopher. That's what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. This is where, uh, you know, uh, I, I've got a book on my shelves there, that, you know, Descartes error. Yeah. Which is a wonderful a, a neurosurgeon looking at the brain and, and how the brain evolves and so on. I mean, it's just, just incredible stuff. Um, so what, what we're doing now is that we're uh, creating little areas uh, just simply because we don't know what else to do with them. But, but we've lost, it's, well, it's my, like my argument. Everybody's running around with a piece of the puzzle, but we've lost the box top. And it, it's so basic that with, with regard to the earth and the atmosphere, we haven't even got the four corner pieces. The way you do a puzzle is you find the four corner pieces first. That becomes then the anchor of your puzzle. It doesn't tell you the size of the puzzle or, or uh, you know, the, the, the uh, final format of it. Then the second thing you do is find the edge pieces. Well, we haven't got the four corners found. We haven't even got a half of the edge pieces yet. And all we've got in the middle is piles of, of, of puzzle pieces piled up basically on the color of each. Oh, well, that's all red, so we'll put that in that pile. That's how you do a puzzle. That's where we're at. We're trying to understand this whole, uh, uh, not only our universe, but beyond the universe. Exactly. If, you look at, if you look at the climate issue, um, uh, one of the things that we are not dealing with is the fact that 
the, where we're talking about the Ice Age. Well, we came out of the last Ice Age about 20,000 years ago. Uh, it began about 3 million years ago. But if you go back 250 million years ago, there was another Ice Age. There have been at least, uh, some people argue, as many as nine Ice Ages in the history of the Earth. Yeah. Well, what's your theory? What's your explanation for that? Exactly. And the, one of yeah. yeah one of one of the theories is that the sun, as it orbits the Milky Way, passes through these arms of galactic dust, which then cause the sun to send less energy to the Earth, which triggers the ice age. Right. Right. And and it's it, like so it many factors. I mean, it's not only the oh. tilt, right. I mean, it's the magnetical gravitational uh, effect yeah. of it. It's solar system. It's like yeah. you know, so. I mean. It's like so easy to, you know, to yeah. create such a false, deceptive theory about CO2, which is, uh, I mean, uh, it's it just mind boggling that, that people f uh, fall for this lie. But, but here's the problem, Kevin. That's the only way you can proceed. The difference, the difference is now, in the old days, people would say, hey, this is what I believe now, but I know that we're going to find different things. I mean, that this is what uh, Copernicus and all these people were about. We're discovering, and as they discovered things, then it changed the, uh, the, the, uh, the fundamental understanding. Now that the church and some of the groups resisted and, and, and all the rest of it, but, but the science progressed in spite of that. Now what you've got is uh, that what these students are being taught and what the people are being taught about the earth is, is the final and absolute definitive explanation of everything. And, and it isn't. That's where the real problem comes. And, and part of that was going to re relate this to your earlier comments. One, one of the things about the, um, the current environmental view of the world is that is, uh, it's anti-humanity. Yeah. That humans are not supposed to be here, that we're an aberration. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, humans are, are natural, we're just another animal, and, and then turn around and say, oh, no, we're, we're superior, we're different. This is the philosophical contradiction that's going on right now. And, and you, I see it everywhere. I, I talk to these environmentalists, say, well, do you believe in Darwin? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Darwin said survival of the fittest. So get the unfit off my planet. Oh, well, you know, you think, oh, they don't even think the extent to which their view of the world has been dictated and indoctrinated into their minds. That's where the real danger is. We're all, we've all been indoctrinated, or all, but the majority indoctrinated into one view of the world. And as I said, added to that, they've been indoctrinated into the belief that this is the truth and, and there is no other truth. Exactly. Um, to wrap this up, Doctor. Um, yeah. Well, uh, is how do you how do you see the future? I mean, what what needs to be done structurally from the root, that, you know, upwards? Uh, because you know, this is, our society is so conditioned to talk about the symptoms. So, where do you see us, like in 10, 20, 30 years? How is this going to evolve? Are we going to become wiser, more mature? I mean, collectively, as, as a human civilization, as a collective. Um, what's your opinion on that? I mean, what's your take on that? How is this going to be, you know, evolving uh, from, from, you know, from our transformational process, evolutionary process in our comprehension? Well, it, what, what we've discussed up to this point is that there are these natural evolutions and things going on, and then the human uh, and the political interfere with that. They block it, they, they limit it, uh, they divert from it. Um, if, we, if we were to uh, uh, ideally, and of course, it, the, the, there, there's never an idea, but ideally, what would happen is that, that we'd have complete freedom of ideas and thought, and that, that we, we would then allow anybody to pursue whatever line of thinking uh, that they wanted to. And then, of course, with, with the beauty of the internet, um, and, and the internet, by the way, is it's a profound change in the history of humanity. And the reason, I, the reason I say that is because 
and I gave a talk in Phoenix a year ago. It's the final phase of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, American is exceptional because it puts the individual above the state. It puts the private ownership of land above the state ownership of land. It, it puts um, the, the individual above the state. Uh, but the one thing the individual didn't have up until the internet was access to information. Control of the information is control of power, and that's been the theme of our whole discussion here. Uh, what you're going to see, and uh, you're already seeing hints of it, is uh, uh, governments attempting to control the internet. Yeah. I did, I did a program, uh, funnily enough, on Zoom just on last Friday with uh, about 16 people from five different countries. Mm -hmm. None of them are academics. They're all citizens who are trying to make some sense, like you're talking with me about, about what's going on. What do I believe? And um, so they're using the internet and Zoom to uh, get people like me on and saying, okay, what's your view? What are you saying? And then from that collective wisdom, draw their own conclusions. That is what the internet can potentially provide for us. And I, they said to me at the end, what's, your, what's the one thing you'd warn us against? And I said, fight any attempt by any government anywhere to limit internet or control the internet. Exactly. So it's about decentralization. I mean, this yes. is my favorite team because yep. uh, topic because I've been researching from Austrian economics perspective, monetary yep. perspective, the central bank, Bitcoin. It's about decentralization. Yeah, got to yep. get rid of decentralized centralized structures. Yes. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. Well, well, from from 1859 on, it, it all was towards globalization, towards centralization. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it, it sort of all came in, didn't quite get together, and now is exploding back out the other way, back to regionalism. And, and uh, you see that with Brexit, you see with what's going on in America. I, I, I happen to think Canada is going to divide up into at least two different countries because uh, it just simply... Um, the, the the forces, the centrifugal forces, are so great that it can't hold itself together anymore. Well, right. that that's what's happening around the world, and and um, and of course, it's back to uh, the individual groups of of culture and language, and each wants their own state, and and that and that's interesting. By the way, look at the growth in the number of states in the United Nations. And I think that that will continue until the United Nations will no longer be able to function. And that will be, will, that will be a great advance in human history, as far as I'm concerned. I think the United Nations was an attempt, at, the final attempt at globalization, and, and will collapse in on, on itself. Um, but um, it, it, um, if, we can, if we as the people can maintain the uh, access to information and the internet, and guard against any attempt to control it. Now, uh, uh, what I told this group, uh, I said, you know, uh, Obama tried to control the internet, but what they what they do is they, the being the left wing, the people that want total control of everybody, um, they will come up with a what sounds like a reasonable reason for doing it. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's it's um, you like this story. When I was a teenager, I, I heard this joke, and I realized how funny it was, but I didn't realize the implications of it. And it was about this guy at Hyde Park Corner, which is still the only place in England where you can speak against the government and not get arrested for it, because wow. England doesn't have free speech. And a guy goes out with his soapbox, and he starts shouting, come the revolution, we're going to do this, and come the revolution, we're going to do that. And of course, he's going down the list, and it's smaller and smaller things. And finally, he says, come the revolution, we'll all wear shirts and ties. And a voice from the back of the crowd says, I don't want to wear a shirt and a tie. And the guy on the soapbox says, come the revolution, you'll do what you're bloody well told. Right? That's, that's what people are starting to, to find out. And of course, what... what uh, uh, Obama tried to do was he said, look, these internet providers are uh, ripping you off. They're far more powerful than you are. There's nothing that you as an individual citizen can do. Therefore, you need the government to take care of them for you. Mm -hmm. No, that's the last thing I need. Exactly. But, yeah, and and uh, so uh, 
this this is where I think this is where we are right now. I, I think that the, the world is going back towards smaller government, smaller uh, regional control, which is healthy. Uh, pe people don't want somebody somewhere else making decisions for them that they have no say over. They want to be able to meet their politician in the grocery store, yeah. not just see them as some figure on TV. And, and that, that, by the way, is one of the things about uh, the, the computer and, and the internet and so on. We still prefer to have a face in front of us, a real face. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I was involved in is, is uh, long distance learning. And it all with, with the computer and the internet, we can have you know, one teacher sitting in one place and teaching. No, no. I don't care if the student has to drive an hour. <laughs> They've got to be face to face. The, the ability to read the other person's face, to see the other person's face. The hum in other words, what, what technology is doing is taking the humanity out of being human. Mm -hmm. And we've got to stop that. We've got to don't allow that to become the, the very thin but very strong uh, boundary between us as humans. And, and instead serving. I mean, technology is yes. supposed to be serving humanity. Ex exactly. And not exactly. being instrumentalized or whatever into this kind of virtual uh, transhumanistic world that, yep. I don't know, some people are dreaming about, you know. Well, but that, but that's, a, that's a thing that we also need to look at. Look at the range of human intelligence and abilities. I mean, I, the reason I taught a science credit for our students was because 80% of the student body are terrified of science, don't want to be in science. You could divide the, the, you can divide the human population up to 80% that are like numbers and 20 or, or don't like numbers and 20% are comfortable with numbers. And, and of course, that's why the, the mathematicians, the nerds of the world, have taken over the world because they understand computers. They can dictate to everybody else. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, the person says, I don't care what your computer says. This is what I'm going to do. And that's the battle that's going on right now between the pure logic and the beautiful illogic of humanity. I've learned so much from you, Dr. Ball, <laughs> in these one and a half hours. Um, I really want to thank you from my heart and soul for your, you know, courage and ethos and your transparency and your authenticity and the, the truth that you're speaking out. I mean, it's really, you, we only have a handful of people like you um, who really dare or have the courage to, you know, do the re real research and work scientifically and uh, yeah. speak out the truth. Is there any concluding thoughts or, or comments you want to give to the viewers and listeners? I, I think that um, one of the good things that's happening is that the fake news has become so pandemic that uh, it's, it's forcing people to question everything, that it's being forced on them, but that's a good thing. In other words, don't take anything at face value. And um, so I think that out of and, and this is what's important when you look at human history and evolution of the world. You have a disaster, but out of that, and that's what the Greeks talked about, the phoenix rising out of the disaster, the ashes. And, and I think that that's what, we, what I see happening now. The internet was brilliant, uh, but it, it got abused and misused, and it led into this whole fake news issue. And uh, now the healthy uh, skeptical, but there's a fine line, and I, I warn my students, the best thing you can be is, is a skeptic. If you're not a skeptic, you can't be a scientist from the, from, from the top of things. Mm -hmm. I think if you're not a skeptic, you can't be a human being. Mm -hmm. The danger is slipping from skepticism into cynicism, mm -hmm. where you say, the hell with the world, it's not worth saving. That's, that is a danger point, and I think that's what we've got to guard against. Wonderful conclusion. Um, Dr. Tim Ball, author of Human Cause Global Warming, The Biggest Deception in History, subtitled, and the second book is The Deliberate Corruption of Climate Science, a PhD, Doctor of Historical Climatology. Thank you so much. 
uh, Dr. Ball. I hope to have you soon uh, in the near near future. Maybe we'll talk yeah. about some other topics too. But it's been a really insightful, um, a lot of wisdom that we, you know, we all can learn from you. And yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that, and I'm happy to talk anytime. One of the things that, that I'll throw into your mind to think about, um, out of my interest in climate, and I was interested in the impact of climate on the human condition, that led me into two things. One, one is, of course, realize that precipitation, which nobody's looking at, everybody's looking at temperature, when precipitation from the, the fauna and fauna are, are concerned is far more important. Um, and and the, the other thing is it led me into geopolitics. Mm -hmm. Because when you, you don't, you can study history and you can study geography and you can get something out of them individually. But until you put history on the stage of geography, then you start to understand what, what's really going on. And you see it going on in Israel right now where control of passes in Israel are crucial to what's going on. You go and read the Bible, those same passes were critical 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. The geography is still dictating the history. And until you put those together and understand them, you really don't understand what's going on in the world or what will go on in the future because a lot of it is very predictable. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Kayvan. I really appreciate That's, it. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Yep. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.